Okay, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. I'm Andrew Cox, the CEO of Invasive Species, and I'm coming you, to you today on the land of the Bindal and Wobulgara Gaba people, and as us whiteies call it, Townsville. So welcome to Aliens Among Us Q&A. So this one's special for us today because it features a guest of the author of a book who we named the series after, Aliens Among Us. So the guest is the reason why we're starting today in the early afternoon for most people in Eastern Australia. Um, and we've got Leslie Anthony, the author, coming to you live from Whistler, Canada. So good evening, Leslie. Uh, thank you, Andrew, good evening. Uh, hello, everybody especially everyone who's tuned in and uh, uh, really happy to be here. And I very much appreciate the time zone manipulation that you took on to make it happen. Thanks. Excellent. This is our book that's the feature, Alien Among Us. And, um, but I'm going to welcome our other panelists first. Um, we've got Invasive Species Council Ambassador, former Tasmanian Senator, Christine Mill. Welcome, Christine. Thanks, Andrew. Delighted to be here. Hey, well, Christine knows lots about invasive species. She was in my dealings with her when she was in political office. Uh, invasive species were always central to our conversations. Very personally interested. So thanks, thanks for your lifelong commitment, Christine. And then also today we've got a biologist and acclaimed author, Tim Lowe. Um, Tim, uh, just before I switch to Tim, Tim produced this book, Feral Future. It's almost like the Australian equivalent of Aliens Among Us, but it's the reason why the Invasive Species Council was formed. He was a co-founder of the Invasive Species Council. So welcome, Tim. Thank you, Andrew. Great to be here. And most of all, welcome to everybody who's joined us. We've got over 100 people joining us today, uh, this, this webinar. So as I mentioned, I'm Andrew Cox, the CEO of the Invasive Species Council. Now, before we launch into this, I'd probably need to give you a bit of background about, about how I met Leslie and about, about this book. Um, well, actually, why I learned about this book is I was at a bit of a, a loose end or a bit, a bit of a loss. I wanted to explain invasive species to our broader audience. The public often doesn't understand the process of invasion. So I went to the guru of invasive species, Daniel Zimbaloff, who's a US scientist who's very old, but he's been pivotal in some of the key um, sort of learnings and papers about invasive species. And I asked him, well, what, what is the best reference to explain the invasion, invasion process? And this book was still uh, not in print. It was just being developed and he, he directed me to the publishers. And then, you know, it, 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 it did that. It was a very simple explanation about invasive species. Um, so I was so pleased to be introduced. It. And then in three years ago, I was invited to a keynote address of the Invasive Species Council of British Columbia. And that's where, surprise, surprise, I met Leslie Anthony, who is still, despite reading this book, going along to conferences and getting involved in invasive species. So that's just fantastic, as, as is Tim. So... Um, I just want to now um, just remind you, if this is a Q&A session, so towards the end, we'll, we'll um, come back to some questions that the audience can ask. But down the bottom of your screen, there's two ways of participating. There's a chat and a Q&A. Don't use the chat, use the Q&A. So if you can just put your questions in there, and at the end, we'll select the best one or two to ask our panelists and to Leslie. So... Uh, I'll just start with uh, the first question, just so we can get to know our, our author, Leslie, and the panelists a little bit better. So, so Leslie, when I read the book, um, you very powerfully talk about your upbringing and, and, and how you interacted with invasive species, but you also talk about a drive you, you took from Vancouver um, home to Whistler. It's, it's not that far, it's just a couple of hours. Just take me through both your early life and that drive home um, in May one morning. Sure. Thanks, Andrew. Um, 
Well, I, you know, I guess I'd grown up surrounded by invasive species, but like most of us, didn't really know it. And then uh, when I'd find out that something was invasive, I didn't really think that, that much about it. And that all changed while I was writing a previous book uh, called Snake Bit, which was about uh, the world of herpetology. I was going back and I was looking at places that had influenced me as a kid. And I, I noticed that none of them that were really natural environments or ecosystems. Uh, you know, this is 30 or 40 years after the fact. And that made me start thinking about a lot of other places I'd been in the world on assignments and realizing that they weren't natural either. So that almost everywhere and everyone had some kind of invasive species story. It was a little bit like um, a movie with a twist ending, you know, where the hero doesn't expect what's coming. And then all of a sudden you see them flashing back, looking at all the events and reinterpreting them going, oh yes, of course, this is how it was always going to end, you know? So um, that, that was the basic idea I tried to capture in The Aliens Among Us. And so that introductory drive from Vancouver to Whistler, it wasn't just about me seeing everything in a new light, uh, which I was, but also having this epiphany that I was part of it, that um, I was moving invasive species around on my clothing, with my car, with my shoes, with like literally everything I did in my life was contributing to the situation. So, yeah, great. Um, it, it really brought home to me how much I'm culpable in the invasive species problem, even though I really don't want to be. So we're all part of this problem, aren't we? I'll, I'll just um, come to Christine and, and Tim. Christine, tell me about how invasive species influence your early life and why they can be so frightening. Yes, well, I was brought up on a dairy farm in northwest Tasmania, and Tasmania is a was a colonial society, so mainly from the UK, convicts, jailers, and uh, landed gentry. And so I was surrounded with the consequences of that. So it was starlings, and it was blackbirds, and it was sparrows, and it was rabbits. And the main one that had a big influence on me as a child was gorse. So my family have been Irish and of course in Ireland, gorse is a very strong part of the culture and they brought gorse to Tasmania. Most of these were all brought to Tasmania, of course, in the 1850s or earlier. And we had gorse on the farm and my father, one of his things he used to like is throw a match into the gorse and watch it all go up and the rabbits fly out and the dogs chase and, you know, the whole thing. And as a kid, that was pretty exciting. Um, but of course, uh, the gorse came back stronger than ever next year because he had, of course, accelerated the process uh, of germination. But he didn't realise that, of course, because it was all handed down. This is the way you handle things. And so I then went to boarding school and travelled up backwards and forwards to Hobart and saw that the Midlands of Tasmania was just infested with gorse everywhere. And that was, of course, from the grazing. Um, and so that was my first real awareness of the extent of the damage that invasives do. And then during my years as an environmentalist, I became frustrated that the environment movement generally was really focused on habitat, um, which is absolutely correct, but not looking at the impact of invasives. And that is why I decided when I got into the Senate that I would take this on as well, because invasives in the natural environment is a critical issue. And we're so glad you did. So thank you, Christine. Now, Tim, tell me about the, your early experiences in invasive species. How did you get into invasive species? Um, I suppose as a childhood experience, I really remember was um, my parents, they didn't travel around that much. And so I became very much a backyard naturalist. So I was looking at the butterflies on the flowers in the backyard, the lizards. And I realized that the sparrows and turtle doves weren't native. But then I thought, well, what's in the garden at night and wandering around with a torch? And there were just cane toads everywhere. I don't know how old I was, but it was probably after a wet year when they'd bred up well. And something like uh, 15 or 20 toads hopping around in the garden and just thinking, this is awful. These are not Australian wildlife. Um, um, and so, yeah, just that sense that there was all this uh, wildlife in inverted commas that wasn't what I wanted to see as an Australian. But then I think in terms of writing the book for our future, uh, it was many experiences, but working as an environmental consultant, I, I remember one time 
is in Mount Kutha at the back of Brisbane. And I'm walking through the bushland. It was a time of drought. And then all of a sudden I started seeing all these um, asparagus ferns, these um, foreign ornamental plants in the understory. And there's more and more. And I'm thinking, what's, what's going on here? Why are they growing here? And then I get closer and there's one garden right on the edge of the forest. And as I said, it was in drought. There's a sprinkler going and underneath the sprinkler. There's a big asparagus fern climb. And it's just covered in fruit. And of course, there was nothing else, nothing fruiting in the vegetation. You could just see that birds in the forest would just see these bright red berries. And then the owner of the garden was actually right there. And I said, oh, your, I think your asparagus is... Um, actually contributing quite a bit to weed problems just back in there. And she said, well, well good on it, or, or words to that effect. And I just thought, this is just horrible. And I think it's what Leslie's saying, it's the subtlety of the process that all she's doing is watering a plant, but that's mm -hmm. causing a problem. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I mean, after reading your book, I just see the world differently. Many of other people have told me that. So hopefully that's what people are doing with Leslie's book in uh, Northern America. So Leslie, I'll come back to you now. Um, you, you come, you, you refer a lot to one particular invasive species in your book, and this is Burmese pythons. They are a big problem in the Florida, Florida Everglades, and there's a particular python called Lucy. Now, I've got a photo of this, this python. I don't know whether you can see that at the bottom. That's how big it is. It's five and a half meters, Lucy, the, um, the Burmese python. Tell me what it was like, um, Leslie, meeting Lucy. Well, uh, what can you say about a five and a half meter, 90 kilo snake that hasn't already been set? Um, I, I mean, I like snakes. So on one level, it was, it was cool. Uh, but on another level entirely, it was, oh my God, now I understand this problem. You know, I'd been reading about this problem. I'd been hearing about it. It's kind of hard to wrap your mind around a species like that being invasive at the numbers that they were talking about. And um, to give you a sense of, of the problem itself, uh, I'll, I'll do a little time span thing. So the first python started turning up in the Everglades around the mid 1990s. And it was just like one here and one there. And so, of course, they just thought people were tossing pets that they couldn't keep anymore out of their cars. And then, um, you know, that's the typical latent period that we see with a lot of invasive species where there's not a lot of them around and you're not really thinking about it. Then there's an inflection point around 2004, 2005. Suddenly there's hundreds of pythons. And the next thing you know, the numbers go exponential. And ecologists are talking about a population of like 150,000 of these things must be in the Everglades. And then in 2012, biologists publish a paper about the impact of the pythons on the, the mesomammalian fauna. And, and it was just unbelievable, the results. Basically, 57,000 kilometers of uh, road surveys they had noted a 99% reduction in raccoons and possums uh, over that time period, a 90% reduction in bobcats, and a 100% reduction in rabbits. No rabbit was seen for a decade. Is that and, a good thing or a know, bad thing? It's, well, it's a bad thing because, the, you know, those are elements of the food chain in that ecosystem. Rabbits particularly are the basis for a lot of the other natural predators there. So that's, that was kind of crazy. You know, they eliminated this whole middle layer of, of uh, the food chain and they were surprised and they shouldn't have been surprised because given what the brown tree snake did in Guam, which was basically eat all the lizard, native lizard, native bird and native mammal populations down to negligible, they should have seen this coming when they started finding a few hundred uh, generalist predators like a Burmese python. But, you know, it's a very odd tale because you could never establish an invasive species like a Burmese python in a, anywhere but a national park because people would have noticed it. But because they had this massive subtropical area, the only subtropical area in the United States that nobody was in, 
these pythons that were introduced managed to create a population that was that large in without anyone really even noticing. And and they just quickly they've actually tried to deal with it. I mean, once they noticed it, it is it too late? Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's management now. You know, that's about it. Hundred and fifty thousand pythons. I mean, they have a they have an annual uh, contest, don't they, to try to remove them? But that sounds pretty pointless. Well, until they come up with some sort of genetic drive mechanism or something that they can introduce to the python population that they'll spread around amongst themselves, uh, you, you can't get rid of them all. But and we know how those biocontrol things go; they're they're slippery slope. They're, <laughs> They're a mess. They work, but they're also dangerous. Now, Tim, I might come to you. You've done some work on pythons and even other pets, uh, legal and illegal. Um, are pythons a threat in Australia? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question because, yeah, there was a court case where I was engaged by the federal police to um, write a report uh, about the risk of Burmese pythons um, and various other reptiles and fish that had been smuggled into the country by uh, someone who was, uh, had been charged. And so I was uh, to provide a prosecution report. I mean, I think the interesting thing, you know, our problem in Australia is that we've had cats and foxes wiping out our mammals. In Florida, it's been um, pythons, very, very equivalent situation. And here we could, you know, there was this old narrative about we had primitive wildlife, so it was inferior once you brought in the northern hemisphere animals when you look at the florida situation well no one thinks of snakes as being superior to mammals but they've been able to do it but yes yeah, so i suspect that we actually have native pythons so our wildlife may well be better adapted but burmese pythons are just so much bigger uh, and pythons are very successful i mean there's carpet pythons all through brisbane where i'm speaking there'd be plenty of them near you in townsville mm -hmm. um and yeah having a python that's much bigger is going to be taking much larger prey which might not be very wary about pythons for that reason so australia has a um an invasive pet pet uh, escape pets release pets problem yeah, well, the corn snakes in New South Wales, I mean, there are so many corn snakes have been found around Sydney. You've really got to wonder whether there is a feral corn snake population now in New South Wales. But we've also had, you know, finds of uh, um, chameleons being found, quite a wide range of reptiles. So, yeah, they're smuggling in of reptiles and they just escape. I mean, everywhere where people keep pets, they escape. There doesn't seem to be any way around that. And I think there's a tendency of some people who they might realize that the pet they bought, which was cute and small, I think I've even heard of um, people keeping pet crocodiles, for example, they grow up to be a bit bigger and more problematic, and then they can't bring itself, bring themselves to killing it or dobbing, you know, giving it to the authorities, and they want to release it to do good, um, but they're actually doing bad, right? Yeah, and um, I mean, Irian Jai was a, a terrifying example where Indonesians had brought, sorry, I should call it West, um, West Papua, give it the modern name, but you know, you had Indonesian people had brought pet monkeys, little macaques, then they, when they grow into adults, they're unmanageable, just like large Burmese pythons or, or alligators or crocodiles. And so people let the monkeys go. And so this horrifying possibility of monkeys spreading through New Guinea. Boy, I hope we don't get monkeys in Australia. That'd just be a disaster. Um, you know, yes. All right, I might uh, keep moving on um, because I'm going to come back again to this uh, issue of uh, weird and wonderful pets that people, particularly in Southern America, I don't know whether it's something about their, uh, uh, you know, their culture there. They just want to collect pets and then they release them. Um, so, so Leslie, I want to, this, this is still, we're down in the, the Florida area, aren't we? Um, I want to ask you about the Stenosaura. And I, when I, when you wrote about it, uh, it, it sounded so, such a difficult invasive species to deal with. So tell me about the Stenosaura and how do you catch one? Okay, so uh, the Stenosaura is uh, also known as a black spiny tailed iguana, which is probably more of a mouthful than Stenosaura. And uh, it's a, it's a very aggressive cat-sized omnivore from Central America. And it's in the Guinness Book of World Records as the world's fastest lizard. So there's a problem. Um, they love flowers and eggs and young animals. So 
<laughs> you can imagine oh, the problems boy. that could be created oh, there. Boy. They have made a mess of a series of nearshore islands off the coast of Florida where a few were released in the 1970s. And uh, <clears throat> because they decimated these particular areas, all of which are connected by bridges to the mainland, the big worry was if they get onto the mainland, it's going to be all over for anything that lives or nests from ground level up to tree, the tree canopy. So we're talking sea turtles to burrowing owls to you know other endangered birds and things. But because they're so fast and smart, they're actually a very smart animal, it seems, bounty hunters found that they couldn't trap them. They, they would never go into a trap. And they couldn't noose them you know, the way you would catch other small lizards with fish, uh, fish line noose. Yep. Um, so they took to using fishing lures and casting them towards the bush where the lizards were and then reeling them back quickly. And the lizards would come out of the bush like cats. They would chase these bouncing lures and they would try and get them close enough to shoot them, basically, because that was the only way that they could kill them and uh, get their bounty. So this, as you can imagine, was created some very surreal scenes, which I witnessed and um, comical at the, as much as they were <laughs> serious. And you're right, like Florida is a place where there's all sorts of these strange things going on, be they released pets or, or uh, something like this. So yeah another bizarre one and a, and a dangerous one so far has not made it to the mainland as I understand. And people actually kept these as pets did they? Uh, no it was a just somebody a sea captain a captain I think brought them from Central America and he let them go near his house on this island and that was in the 70s and apparently it was five animals and you know now they're all over the place 100 kilometers worth of uh, barrier islands super dense populations and yeah they've eaten all, everything the only animal no animal can breed on those islands because they eat the eggs and the young animals well so they're biodiversity deserts yes basically wow. uh, and, and they created the same problem with plants because they always eat the flowers the flowers can't seed so there's no native plants growing it's all landscaping oh boy uh that sounds horrendous okay all right, I'm gonna just keep moving on. Um, thankfully, you're a Canadian, not a not a, an American. Um, you have so many lakes there, and uh, you know Canadians love water sports. Um, and then on the border with Canada and the U.S. is the the Great Lakes, and you actually have lots of examples in your book about what's happened there. Uh, it, it sounds another disaster. Um, we don't have big freshwater lakes like you do. Just tell me about the problem about invasive fish and what they've done to the aquatic systems of the Great Lakes. Okay, so just briefly, the, so the Great Lakes are the largest freshwater ecosystem on Earth. They're also the most invaded. And I think the last tally was around 200 species of uh, non-native fish and aquatic invertebrates. And they've had an enormous impact to the extent that there isn't even a cubic centimeter of water that you could take out of any of these lakes that would, that would even have a hint of what the original ecosystem there was like. So that it's plankton, it's everything. There are three main reasons for that. One, the lakes are surrounded by huge cities, Chicago, Detroit, Toronto, Montreal, Cleveland. So there's millions of people and people doing what people do, including commercial and sport fisheries. There's been tons of opportunity, lots of vector, lots of pathways for introducing invasive species, both accidentally and on purpose. A lot of it's been on purpose. So that's number one reason. The second reason is the lakes weren't always connected. But of course, people being people, we started digging canals and connecting everything. And we created this seaway going back to the 1800s and everything was able to move from one lake to another. And third, once the seaway was created and it was created so that ocean going ships could come 
up the St. Lawrence River into this freshwater ecosystem, go to ports, dump stuff off, piss, pick things up. It took people over a century to realize that there was a ballast water problem with these ocean going ships. So they were coming from Eurasia where they'd picked up ballast water in the Ponto Caspian area and they were dropping it in the Great Lakes, you know, and then going back the other way. So those are the three reasons that things are a mess. And the, yeah. the two biggest problems right now are zebra mussels, which you've probably heard of, and, and round goby, and they're both ballast water introductions. And, um, you know, the Canadian and U.S. governments are, are cooperating on a lot of uh, invasive species initiatives and ballast water management laws and things, and they're, they're working together now, and things have improved a lot in the last 10 to 15 years. There have been no new introductions in the last decade of anything that anyone can detect. So something positive anyway. That's impressive. Uh, I mean, I, I hadn't heard of zebra, zebra, zebra mussels until I went to Canada and uh, really uh, heard about their attempts, given the lessons from the Great Lakes about the damage they do and quagga mussels, that they're trying to keep them out of where you are, the British Columbia. And they're doing this very successfully at the moment, but it actually requires a very heavy handed approach to stop people moving boats that uh, aren't properly clean between waterways. So, I mean, imagine Absolutely. trying to, uh, you know, people are moving boats all the time, right? And there's a really heavy, heavy um, presence there. So I'm um, just wondering, you know, that, that I guess there's some heroic people there trying to do the right thing. And it sounds like they're starting to succeed if there's been no new introductions recently. So you're, they're trying to keep carp out of the lakes, is that right? Yeah, there, there's uh, these things called Asian carps, and it refers to four different species of carp. They're all very large, 40 kilos each, and they respectively feed on phytoplankton, zooplankton, plants, or yeah, and then benthic invertebrates like mussels and clams. And each, so each one of them has a different food guild, and they're all in the Mississippi Basin. The Mississippi Basin is right next door to the Great Lakes Basin, and there's a few little connections between them. And so those connections are the focus of trying to keep the carps from getting into the Great Lakes. And uh, the cost of, of that prevention at the moment has probably been over a billion dollars, and it's probably on the order of $50 million a year for the programs that are going on in the U.S. and in Canada. And unfortunately, one of those species has now made it into one of the Great Lakes, or oh, two okay. of the Great Lakes, actually, the grass carp. And so nobody's really sure what's going on with that. So they held back the tide for a while, but uh, yeah, yeah, gosh, I, I, hope, I was hoping it was going to be a good news story, but uh, these invasive species just keep threatening. Um, I, I might... Um, come to you, Christine, because uh, you've had lots of involvement in politics in Tasmania. Um, what are exotic fish doing to Tasmanian waterways? Well, as I mentioned before, we had a lot of introductions uh, from the UK and from Northern Europe. And so we had brown trout introduced in Tasmania in 1864 and redfin perch about the same time and then rainbow trout about 20 or 30 years later. We've got uh, cool water in Tasmania, cool clear water, and it's perfect habitat for them. And they were spread deliberately through most of Tasmania's lakes and waterways um, as a fishing resource, as to make the uh, colonials feel very much at home. And so they have become the basis now of a tourism industry, of the trout fishing industry. And so uh, whilst there is a recognition that they have had a negative impact on the ecosystem, in fact, the Pedagalaxis um, was a small native fish in Lake Pedder. Uh, when that impound, when the Lake Pedder was flooded and the serpentine impoundment was created for hydroelectricity, they stocked it, of course, with uh, trout. And there is now a small insurance population in one lake in Tasmania in Lake Oberon. Um, but two other of the small galaxid species, the Clarence um, galaxid uh, is threatened. Um, and in fact, the swan galaxid on the east coast of Tasmania as well. 
The fact is in the politics of Tasmania, recreational hunters and shooters and fishers um, do have a huge amount of political sway, more so than environmentalists. And so we are still seeing restocking of areas um, in which these populations have become depleted deliberately to create a recreational fishing resource. Having said that, there have been some successes. The European carp, for example, um, was uh, brought to Tasmania, but there was a, there's been a big effort at eradication. They have eradicated it from Lake Crescent and they are working really hard at um, Lake Sorrel as well. And they think they have got it down to a population that they can then actually get rid of it. So we will see. Uh, Eastern Gambosia is another one in the Tamar River in the north. It's gone too far to be um, to have any attempt at eradication. So there is an awareness there. And of course that has a big impact on frog species in particular. We didn't ever have a full um, analysis of what was in those natural ecosystems before the trout was introduced because we're talking about the 1850s. And so we don't really know the full extent of what yep. we have. And that is an issue. The other issue we've got on, on invasives is the East Australian current, which is a warm ocean current as a result of global warming, has come further and further down the coast of Tasmania, bringing with it the, the long um, spiny sea urchin. And that has wiped out the kelp beds and wiped out a lot of, uh, a lot of the habitat for fisheries on the east coast. It used to be the sub-Antarctic upwelling and then it was being pushed south and as I said the East Australian current has come down. So we've got a, a global warming driving the invasion into our uh, east coast ecosystem uh, and introduced species which introduced to us, it's a native species in Australia, but uh, introduced to us and causing havoc. Yeah, wow. So we've got a new form of invasive species, uh, a climate change um, induced invasive species. Gosh, that's, there's going to be plenty more of that. Uh, look, just a reminder, there's a, few, uh, there's a few questions already coming in the Q&A. Make sure you pop them in the Q&A, uh, not in the chat. Although I did uh, see someone put in the chat that we've, uh, there was an outbreak of zebra mussels in Darwin Harbour in 1999 that was controlled. That's, I'm glad we've... Uh, they weren't, they weren't zebra mussels, they were a different kind of mussel. Okay, well, just still good news though, but yeah, all right, that's good. Thanks, thanks Tim, for clarifying that. So just a reminder, uh, you can both enter a question in the Q&A or you can even upvote one you like. So I'm just going to, uh, we're, we're moving through things, so that's excellent. Um, I want to just touch on a concept that's uh, recognized in the invasive species world, which is this idea of invasion meltdowns. Now, I think we've just heard a few invasion meltdown stories around the Great Lakes and, and some of the, the catastrophic damage that the Stenosaura have done. But the one thing that really surprised me, one of the examples, there's so many examples in this book, um, but was around earthworms. And it sounds like there's a massive invasion of earthworms throughout Northern America. It's sort of happening under our noses, but it's actually far more disruptive and transformative than you could, you could believe. Um, Leslie, do you want to just take us through what's going on with earthworms and their relationship with uh, the native deer? Sorry, mute. I had myself muted there. Good. Invasional meltdown is a pretty interesting concept. Uh, it basically describes a situation where, uh, you know, one successful invader uh, facilitates the establishment of, of another one, and then perhaps another one in some kind of series. Uh, the results can be devastating, as you mentioned. And the earthworm situation is super interesting because most people in Central and Northern North America have no idea that all of the earthworms in their gardens and in the forest are non-native. That all of the worms were wiped off of the continent by the last Pleistocene glaciation, which scraped all the soil and all the worms and pushed them south. So all the earthworms that are there are introduced. And, and they've been introduced to most areas because people uh, have farmed all over the place. And so the worms have moved into forests and basically northern forests never evolved to deal with 
to function with worms. There's a typically in a, in a North American hardwood forest, there's a thick layer of leaf litter or duff. And uh, when you introduce earthworms, they draw all of that down. And then you get this bare forest, this bare mineral soil, uh, which is drier and has less nutrients. And that then makes the soil perfect for invasive European plants. So here you have an invasive earthworm facilitating the invasion of European plants. Once these European plants get going, they tend to attract deer and the deer increase in abundance. So we have an eruption of a native species that basically is de facto invasive. Um, and the native tree seedlings have a hard time establishing on this bare mineral soil that the worms have created and any that do pop up, the deer eat them. So we've got no new trees growing. When all the older trees die, they're not replaced by anything. So the forest starts to get holes in it and uh, you add in climate change and pretty soon you've turned a hardwood forest into an open savanna, courtesy of earthworms, deer and climate change. Wow, gosh, <clears throat> I think that's what I've really enjoyed about your book. You, you can explain really complicated situations very simply. And the other thing about you is you, uh, you're a travel writer too, but you also have this sort of funny way of talking about it too, which makes it engaging. So uh, look, you've just, um, that, you've just done a great explanation of that, that, that issue. I might, just, um, I might just flick to Tim just briefly because I'm here in Townsville to, talk, to, to meet some people to talk about yellow crazy ants, but there's a yellow crazy ant invasion meltdown going on in Christmas Island in the far northwest of Australia. Tim, do you want to just give us a quick uh, rundown of why we call that an invasion? meltdown. Yeah, and I've visited Christmas Island, um, I think about 11, 11 or 12 times. So it's been amazing to see how that ecosystem has changed. So the yellow crazy ants there form these huge super colonies. Um, and what it means is that when you're in the rainforest, I mean, the whole island where it's not mined is rainforest. If you scratch away the leaf litter, there's just ants under every leaf, uh, roll a lock, hundreds of ants run out. Uh, the island's native crabs are restricted by and large to areas where there aren't many ants. I mean, there's been a lot of poisoning of ants to help the crabs, but the ants are able to maintain very high numbers, even when they've eliminated huge populations of insects, because you're finding ants and not many um, invertebrates, you get um, millipedes that have got a really hard exoskeleton that the ants can't breach. But there's um, sap-sucking scale insects up in the trees, and these are providing a honeydew. These sugary secretions form from the sap of the trees, maintaining very high energy levels. And so rather than the ants dying out once they've depleted all the insects, these um, scale insects are feeding them all this sugar high up in the canopy. The ants are protecting the scale insects from uh, predators that would control them. And so you've got some of the trees like Tahitian chestnuts are dying back from this combined, um, well, from the attacks of the, um, uh, the scale insects protected by the ants. So this whole, just whole ecological shift where the structure of the rainforest is changing, some of the trees are dying, the crabs were uh, browsing on seedlings. Now the crabs are gone. You get these groves of particular plants coming up, those that are not appealing to the scales. And yeah, mm -hmm. it's a massively shifted system. Yeah, wow. Well, uh, that's right. So they call that ecosystem meltdown for a reason. So that's, that, that, that really sums it up well. Well, I'll keep just moving forward. Um, I'm just going to just talk. I'm going to move, I mean, hopefully to think about what it all means. Um, I mean, there's so many stories of doing the wrong thing, making mistakes or not listening to the warnings. Um, but there's a, just a quote that stands out for me in the book. Um, it's actually from a really important book in 1958 um, by a British ecologist, Charles Elton. And I'll just uh, read it directly because it's a really important quote. Now, Charles Elton says, Instead of six continental realms of life, these are the continents around the world, separated by barriers to dispersal, 
there will only be one world with the remaining wild species dispersed up to their limits set by the genetic characteristics. So if you think about that as where we're heading, uh, one world, not six separate continents, it's quite sad to finish on. Does that mean an organization like the Invasive Species Council should just shut up shop? That what we're trying to do is just pointless and uh, a waste of time? Um, and we should just let everything rip into Australia because eventually they're all gonna arrive here and it's gonna undo that millions of years of evolution that, that creates everything we love in Australia about our, our wildlife, our plants and animals. Christine, maybe you might be the one to answer this question. What are the attitudes about this dilemma in Australian politics? And um, should we just give up and not bother with trying to control invasive species? Well, absolutely not. And in my view, it's it's more important than ever right now because we're in the midst of the climate emergency and biodiversity collapse. And uh, people are beginning to recognise at the global level, especially that in alien invasive species are a major driver of extinction. And we all know that unless we've got resilient ecosystems, we're not going to have uh, the functioning systems that effectively support life on earth. We have got to maintain our carbon stores, our forests, our wetlands, everything that we have got and as many species as we can in those functioning ecosystems. So I think the issue here is the problem in Australia has been that invasive species have been taken seriously by the primary industry sector and by the farming and fishing sector for a very long time. They haven't been taken so seriously by the environmental activist community. So if you look at all the NGOs in Australia, very few of them have got activists working on inv alien invasive species. You'll have a lot of people in Tasmania working, for example, on protecting the World Heritage Area, protecting forests, but only the Invasive Species Council working on the incursion of feral deer into the World Heritage Area, which of course are undermining the values of the World Heritage Area as we speak. So my view is it's more important than ever, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, UNEP, uh, IPCC, they're all now saying, building resilience in ecosystems in the face of accelerating global warming means get going on invasive species as well. So in my view, it's now time to step up. It is the classic case of when the going gets tough, the tough get going and where that's exactly where we need to be. And I think it's a challenge to environmental campaigners as much as anything, because as I said, the traditional primary industry lobby gets it in Australia. Biosecurity has always been a focus of theirs, mainly because invasive species threaten production, costs them a lot of money, threatens their export markets, and so they're right into it. Uh, so from a, uh, an environmental point of view, Australia has such a high level of endemism uh, we have got such a responsibility to try to maintain ecosystems and maintain as many of those species as we can. So uh, I think our job as environmentalists is to lift the profile of invasive species in the activist community as being a response to global warming and biodiversity collapse. And once people get that, then they will see that it's a, a very important part of our campaigns. Excellent. Well. Uh... Australia is an island and a continent, so we've got this distinct advantage, one government, we can certainly um, really make a big difference on this front. Um, I might just come back to you, Leslie, on this, on this particular quote. You're the one who put it in the, in the book. Um, and you also talk about the McDonaldization of our ecosystem. So, I mean, are you uh, an optimist or a pessimist on this front, Leslie? Oh, uh, uh, well, I don't, I, I don't think, I, I don't know how to answer that. Um, you know, I talked to so many people when I was writing this book and asked them a very similar question. Uh, you know, I, I feel like, I feel like no one was able to say I'm an optimist or I'm a pessimist. I'm a realist and doing nothing is the, is the wrong way to go. Like, I, I can't throw my hands up. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'm, what Christine just laid out is the basic issue at stake here, the integrity of, of uh, biodiversity on the planet. And 
and we should all be kind of rallying to that. So I'm optimistic about maybe being able to to get people more well informed on that and mobilize them. Um, I'm pessimistic in that that will take a while and that every minute thousands of things are being introduced everywhere. Things might have slowed down a tiny bit during the pandemic because of a deglobalization, but it's picking up again. I mean, that was Elton wrote that it was his it was his warning lament, you know, it was this kind of summary statement on the book. It was like how he saw the future if if people didn't get onto this subject. It was the homogenization of the world, as you say, the McDonaldization of temperate and tropical ecosystems. And sadly, a lot of that has come true. You know, you can see the same birds and trees and plants in Copenhagen, Tokyo, Toronto, Seattle. And it really makes you wonder about this band of similarity that's gonna happen around uh, various temperate and tropical and subtropical areas. So, but I agree with Christine, obviously shouldn't let that happen. This should mobilize us. This is the very reason Invasive Species Council exists and organizations like this is to is to carry on you know and and uh, try and and do something about this and it's uh i think it's a noble uh thing you know we we have a duty and um you know and we have a duty as as uh as people who've been involved in creating the problem but also just because we live here and the beauty of life and what we appreciate it about it the most is its diversity. And so everything we can do to preserve that, we should. I really like that. We all have a duty. And maybe I might come to Tim now because uh, I'm, I'm sort of this, this book, Feral Future, that Tim wrote. Um, he didn't just need to write a book. He didn't feel compelled just to write a book. He felt a duty to, to act on, on, on that. And so did many other people who read the book and formed our organization three years later. So Tim... Uh, what's your take on this? Um, are we going to uh, lose this 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 um, this battle that we're constantly in, or uh, are we going to actually um, save the day? Well, I think that you know, being realist rather than optimist or pessimist that Leslie was talking about. I mean, that is spot on. That um, it could always be worse. We can't, we, we can't get rid of cane toads, but we can stop black spine toads coming in. I mean, they keep getting intercepted at our borders. And we do have, I mean, I think it's a really good example. You know, here's another toad could move into different parts of Australia. It's been kept out for the last 20 years. Um, Australia can keep keeping it out and that it's not about total victory or total failure. It's doing what you can. I don't think the homogenous scene is realistic for Australia. I, I think we will keep an essential Australia um, and with Invasive Species Council it can be a very Australian Australia that is my that is my hope. Well that's that's heartening for me and and our work so um, yeah that's I'm going to keep charging forward and hopefully we can keep can, can bring about that future we're aspiring to thanks. Now I might just come to some questions that are coming through in the chat and a few of you uh, have upvoted quite a few of them I'm and there's some similarities in, in some of the questions. So I might, um, I mean, I'll put the question to all three of you, but I'll start with, with Leslie. Um, this first question from Robin Pergel, um, how do you relay the importance of invasive species management to the public? It seems we're struggling to communicate the science and the seriousness of the issue to the public to take meaningful action. So we've been touching on this already a bit. Um, this, you know, this is a communication problem and maybe Leslie as a, as a writer, professional writer, uh, professional traveler, um, how do we get better at communicating this problem? You've written the book, but obviously there's more that we can do. Yeah, um, well, I did write a book, but I, I recognized that that, that wasn't gonna be, um, a motivating <laughs> factor in the general population. And, and it, it, it turns out that I wrote a lot of magazine articles as well. Um, 
on the way to writing this book, which uh, when I first started doing th those, I very much was thinking about this issue. Like I need to communicate this particular problem, bullfrogs or whatever it was, deer on Anticosti Island. I, I need to tell people about this. And so, you know, I was able to do that in, in these more widely distributed uh, mediums. Um, that's what I can do, I guess, you know, based on uh, the kind of work I do. But I also joined the local uh, Sea to Sky Invasive Species Council. Um, been with them for many years. I, I'm now the chair of it. And I've gotten involved in a lot of other types of outreach. And, and I do see the issue of how difficult it is to communicate, to find interesting ways to communicate things to people. And you talked about the zebra mussel blockade at the BC border that we, you know, there's, you can't cross into BC now without somebody, if you have a boat, even a canoe on your roof, someone will stop you and they'll check, you know, your, your vessel to uh, see that it's been cleaned and dried. And, um, you know, that's a way to communicate is, is actually having government officials and people who are from different departments, um, you know, out there and visible, not just signs up, but like people communicating the seriousness of moving boats that might have zebra mussel villagers on them or moving hardwood that might have emerald ash borers on them. I don't know. Uh, yeah. The other problem is it's, it's like we have a lot going on these days that commands people's attention. So this is just one more of 10 million things, 9 million of which are bad news. And it's kind of hard to break through the consciousness of people who are just fed up with stuff that they've already got to worry about. Yeah. Christine, do you have any take on the communication problem we're facing? You've touched on al already about many aspects of this, but uh, is there anything we should be doing more of and uh, or, or that we're not doing at all? Yes, we need to be demonising certain pets. We need to demonise cats. You know, it's a huge problem in Australia and the minute you try to actually do control of cats, you get everybody saying, oh, but I've got a cat and it's a really nice cat and it wears a bell and I make sure I keep my cat inside and so on and so forth. Once you start showing them, though, the night footage, the, the, um, and this is one of the communication tools that we now have that we haven't had in the past, we're actually able to put those camera traps out into the wild and people can, say, can see their feral cat now eating native wildlife and so on. So I think we've got the tools now in terms of the technology that we need to demonstrate to people how importing certain pets and having certain pets are a big threat to the ecosystem. I think the pandemic has demonstrated to people what happens when you get pathogens that spread around the world and so on. I think we've now got a point where we need to influence governments to put serious money into budgets that address biosecurity, address threatened species, and the other half of that is, of course, invasive species. So I'm, I'm confident that we just haven't made, we haven't helped people make the connection with their lifestyle, whether it's fishing, bushwalking, whether it's whatever, what they see and how, it, how invasive species has impacted their own engagement with their own environment. If we can do that, mm. we will actually start moving this agenda along. So I feel like um, it is a public awareness issue. And once the public become aware, then they get motivated. Excellent. Yeah, well, um, thinking about um, getting motivated, um, there's a question that's come through from Sam Dalton, and he's actually asking Tim about what he thinks about Campa Laurel. So I'll, I'll ask Tim about that in a second, but it's a what it, because the question is about, well, um, Campa Laurel, because they're spreading so widely in parts of uh, Eastern Australia, they're actually contributing to afforestation when we need more trees in the landscape. So we have these often arguments to justify invasive species. So maybe I might hand the question over to Tim and then maybe Leslie can wrap up and that'll be our last question. 
Tim, what do you think about uh, camphor laurel? Yeah, Andrew, I mean, it's, it's interesting, the whole issue of the ecological impacts of introduced species, they are very compl complex and just saying they are bad can be uh, considered too simplistic and not, um, you know, not the whole story. But yeah, th there's, there's no question that camphor laurel fruits have allowed some rainforest birds in New South Wales to rebuild their numbers, such as um, white-headed pigeons, top knots and so forth. But these um, camphor laurel forests outside the um, fruiting season, there's no insectivorous birds inside them because um, the camphor in the leaves means there's no, there's no insects on them. So it's a, a benefit to a small number of birds. Um, there is some indications of other rainforests, of, of native rainforest trees coming up under these camphor laurel groves. So there is a potential now to kill camphor laurels and get rainforest underneath. So it's possible that we can get the return of more diverse forests um, by managing camphor laurels in that way. So um, I think it'll be interesting to see whether whether that does come about, whether the um, poisoning of the large camphor laurels does give you back something better. Thanks, Tim. Now, I might just uh, uh, ask Leslie to respond, but uh, I guess what I'd like him just to talk about is this issue of those who want to argue invasive species are good for the world or maybe not even realize under their noses there's an invasive species that's sort of being normalized and I, I, I give the example of the Canadians um, new polymer uh, dollar notes that's five dollar ten dollar fifty dollar hundred dollar note it's got a, a maple on it but it's actually an exotic maple it's not even a Canadian maple leaf so Leslie, do you want to just finish off briefly uh, how we're just sort of normalizing invasive species in our world and why we should push back against that? Sure. Well, you know, as Tim said, the, a lot of this stuff is, is not black and white. And, and there, there's an enormous complexity um, to ecology in general. And that complexity has been increased when you're looking at invasive species in novel ecosystems. So teasing apart good effects and bad effects, is it's kind of like a false equivalency thing, I think, in some ways, because, yeah, you could see some benefits, but overall, the bigger picture, uh, and this is an easily empirically demonstrated, is, is quite negative. And so we should stay away from categorizing things that way. And your example is is very interesting because this is a sort of a cultural uh, milieu um, of normalization where, uh, you know, the iconic Canadian maple leaf, the, the symbol that is on our flag, that is on everything made in this country, literally someone wants to put a maple leaf on it. And you know, I grew up in Eastern Canada with maples everywhere. Maple syrup is a big deal. And it's almost comical that when they went to create new banknotes uh, 10 or 20 years ago, that the graphic artist who was charged with that used the leaf of a, of a highly invasive Norway maple as the model for... <laughs> The, the symbol that he put on those banknotes. And, you know, I don't, I think that people didn't notice for a while. And then, you know, some folks, some invasive species people in the capital said, hey, wait a minute. And now it's too late, you know, and I don't know how they can oh boy. change that situation. There's millions and millions of banknotes floating around with this maple leaf on it, but it just speaks to the fact that this has infiltrated our lives in ways that we can't even imagine. Great. Well, on that note, I think we all need to remain vigilant. Um, maybe that's the theme. Our duty is to remain vigilant. So I want to just uh, thank all the speakers for their time. So Leslie Anthony from, from Whistler, Canada, thank you for uh, your time tonight, in your time, today in our time. Christine Milne, Invasive Species and Ambassador, and Tim Lowe, uh, author, ecologist, and co-founder of our organization. So just the book is 
Aliens Among Us. It's our Q&A series, but this is available from Yale University Press or your good uh, online internet bookstore. And uh, we're going to have another Aliens Among Us uh, session later this year. We're going to have a few more. We're, going to re we're recording this, so that will be up online in a few days' time. Uh, so I want to thank everyone who's come today, all of our supporters, and all of everyone who's made the Invasive Species Council what it is, because we've got a big fight on our hands, and we're going to um, try to make a difference to this continent of Australia. So thanks, everybody. Um, really appreciate your time, and uh, cheerio for now. Thank you.